Welcome to the Los Angeles Times Envelope Grammys Roundtable. I'm Michael Wood, pop music critic at the LA Times, and I'm very happy to be joined here by our amazing panel of Grammy nominees. We have Nija Charles, who's up for Songwriter of the Year, Kim Petras, who's up for Best Pop Duo Group Performance. We have Money Long, who's up for Best New Artist and Best R&B Performance and Song. Blake Slatkin, whose nominations include Record of the Year and Album of the Year. And Babyface, who's up for Best Traditional R&B Performance. I crunched the numbers. I think this might be your 50th Grammy nomination. Sheesh. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Incredible. Anyway, you slice it. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate your time. I'm excited to talk with you guys. I thought we could first talk about TikTok. A lot of the big songs that are up for Grammys this year, a lot of them started on TikTok. TikTok is maybe not started, but got some of their life there. It's really become one of the most reliable, hit-making platforms out there, for better or for worse. And so I wanted to know, first of all, which of you guys are on TikTok? Who, which of you, like, is on TikTok? Yes, yes, yes. All right. Mm -hmm. Who, which of you does TikTok yourself versus your team? OK, OK. Is TikTok and what it's done to pop music, is it something you're generally excited about, generally conflicted about? What's, what's the vibe? Um, I, if there was any reference for what TikTok is, I would say it's like what LimeWire and Napster was. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a new way for us to consume and share and discover music. Um, I think people who like don't want to adapt to change, whatever the next new thing is going to be, they're going to get lost. Mm. Um, and I think people like to demonize TikTok, but I mean, you have songs like Running Up That Hill, that came out in 1985 that literally was nominated for Best Rock Song at the AMAs last night. So yeah. um, I think it's an incredible tool. And if you have the power to have your own billboard and your own platform that you can just be like, hey, guys, look at my new stuff. I don't see why you wouldn't use it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's, what's it feel like to have a song take off on TikTok? Blake, you made About Damn Time with uh, Lizzo. Huge TikTok hit. What, what does it feel like to sort of see a song take off on the platform? I mean, and Unholy with Kim, and mm -hmm. kind of every big song I've ever had has been mm -hmm. purely because of TikTok. I feel like it's like the last straw in being like powers with the people. Like mm. nothing matters marketing-wise, label budget-wise, mm. until kids decide that they love the song on TikTok. Like I've, I've made songs where we spent zero dollars on studios and recorded them with thousand dollar mics that went number one because of TikTok. And I've made songs that took a lot of money to make and a lot of studio time and and those did well and some didn't do well like that. It's like it couldn't matter less. I feel like labels and and managers and even artists are kind of just like you put it out and you kind of just wait for it. To, it's not like you can put any amount of money to make sure something works, which is to me the coolest thing in the entire world because we have equal shot as anyone else in the entire world, even just with their phone. Like, there's mm. huge songs right now because of TikTok, kids on their phone making them by themselves. And it's like, it's all an equal shot to make something great and that people love. Mm. It's the best thing to happen to music in a long time. What about, Unholy is a great example of a song that had a pretty short journey from TikTok to literally number one on Hot 100. This was a very short ride that the song yeah. took to, to get there. What was that like to see it go from one place out into the sort of bigger world that the Hot 100 reflects? Um, oh my God, it, it was amazing. I mean, it's uh, people were so creative and just like had so much fun with the song to begin with on TikTok, and then that translated like pretty much immediately to the charts. And yeah, yeah I mean, it's definitely. Uh, I kind of really agree with uh, Blake. I think it. Uh, gives songs kind of it gives the power to the people of what do we actually like and what do we um uh you know want to make content to and as, a, as an artist like i put out more stuff and leak more things mm. than i have before i was on tiktok you know because i'm just testing stuff out and i'm like do you guys like this vibe that i like do you like this demo should i keep going on this demo you know it's it's cool because people really kind of interact with you and yeah things don't have to be like 
all the way uh, done even. I'm, I mean, with Unholy, uh, Sam and I did a little video of listening to it in the studio and it was pretty like shitty uh, quality of audio, you know, just like on the phone. Yeah, yeah. And like, that's what people liked about it, that it just felt like, hey, we tried making this song, see if you like it. And yeah. then, yeah, if it takes off, that's great. But yeah, it's it's. A, I think it's a positive thing, and I think more music that probably wouldn't would have been like a not front runner for becoming big has become big because of TikTok, because just like more people discovered yeah. things. And, who's yeah. a, when you guys look at who's a, who's a great TikToker in your view? A fellow musician? Who Charlie do you look? Booth. Charlie, Charlie Booth. Charlie Booth. Mm -hmm. yeah. What Lizzo. makes him so good? Lizzo. Um, Lizzo is great too. <laughs> Doja Cat. Doja. Mm. Yeah. Yes. I don't know. They, Charlie will just like. Do like this <laughs> and make it into a. That's the best song you've ever yeah, heard. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. how? Come yeah. on, man. Even if he didn't really do that, he but he made me believe that he did. So yeah. I feel like I'm right there with him in the studio. What about the the snippetization that TikTok encourages? I mean, you guys are all songwriters. You you pour your blood and tears and sweat into a song that you want to be the way it is, and then suddenly mm -hmm. TikTok maybe picks up on a random 15 seconds of the song. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? What's What's that like? Um, I think it just makes, it helps me sharpen my tool as a writer. I think you have to be able to read the room just as a person who is um, sort of chronolog, chronologuing, is that a word? Sure. Um, <laughs> chronologuing life. Um, Cause I believe, you know, Nina Simone said that it's like, we just kind of are writing what we see mm -hmm. and, you know, tell you, like we're historians in a sense. Um, and I think when you take that technique of being able to, okay, they want like a funny thing or they want um, they want a piece that they can apply to their lives, because yeah. really that's what it is. It's like, it's almost like analogies. Um, and you have to be able to tell these analogies with your TikTok. So you want to give people something that they can use. Yeah. Um, I definitely take that into account when I'm writing. I don't try to make songs for TikTok, mm. right. but I definitely make sure that there are clear pieces that people can use and interpret in their own way. I mean, that's what we do with music anyway, but um, there's actually a place where we can like visibly see um, our work being used in everyday life. I think that's the interesting thing is that there are people that make records for TikTok. Mm. And, and rather than just trying to make music or make something special, they just, they're specifically trying to, I think this will go hot on, this will be hot on TikTok rather than just letting the creativity happen. So I don't think it always works that, that way and people think that that's what, what they need to do. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing about TikTok is that um, radio and the record companies used to be the gatekeepers of what was good and what, what people could listen to or not listen to. So there's so many people that never got the chance to even get their stuff heard. So TikTok now opens that door where everybody gets a shot. And it's still a million to one that someone's going to jump on it. But we've seen so many success stories ha happening after it at this particular point. It, it gives it... Um, it gives it meaning at this particular point. So you have to take it seriously. And the record companies and um, and artists do have to look at it in a different way. It's it's an actual tool that you can actually use if it, if you're lucky enough that you write that those 15 seconds of yeah. of whatever that verse is or what that one thing that catches people that makes them decide why well, I want to hear the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it takes the it takes the rest of it for the rest of the world when they get it. It still has to be a great song. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you want it to explode, yeah. yeah. Exactly. I think the snippetization encourages greatness to me too because it's like every part matters just as much as the chorus it doesn't matter how good your hook right. is the mm -hmm. verse is also the chorus mm -hmm. and so is the pre and so is the outro mm -hmm. could be the chorus mm -hmm. and you have no idea so to me as a songwriter producer it just makes me want to do everything i can to make every single yes. second of it the yeah. best it can possibly be yeah. no mm -hmm. dead spots in your song. no dead yeah. spots and right. you can't be lazy about anything yeah. But that's another thing that I love about TikTok is that I feel like it put a focus on lyricism again, especially like with the 15 seconds of snippetization. Like yeah. there's always like the one line that everybody remembers from TikTok. Um, and I think that pushes us as writers to work harder on like what it, what is that one thing that we're going to say mm -hmm. in order to catch people's attention. So it, mm -hmm. like you said, sharpening your tools, I think it definitely helps with that and just makes people want to go harder. Uh, you're all songwriters here. 
I wonder if we if we could get a little bit under the hood, as they say, about modern songwriting. I, I think that people that there's some aspect of it to it that people don't understand, and some of that's some of the big pop songs we hear are very collaborative songs now, right? There was a, an infamous sort of tweet that the legend songwriter Diane Warren sent out when Beyonce's record came out that said, you know, it takes X number of writers. I don't understand how it could take this many writers. Mm -hmm. I think people, there's a temptation to make fun of it or just to not understand how this stuff works. Mm -hmm. Nija, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you worked on uh, Beyonce's song Cozy yes. on her album Renaissance. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what the process is in this modern sort of pop uh, landscape where you may have nine, 10, 12 songwriters on a song what do you, just, just walk us through that. Like, what, what can you say about how Cozy came to life? Yeah, um, so working on Cozy, number one, sometimes where there, why there might be a lot of writers is because um, we're using samples. Yep. So those older songs also get, uh, the, the people on there also get credited. So that's why there are so many songwriters in some songs. Um, but with Cozy, uh, it was already a track with T.S. Madison on it. Um, and I was just, you know, Beyonce was saying that she wanted to make a song um, for all women. And I was just like, what can I think of for female empowerment? So I usually go in with the melody first, mm. but also just running down lines of just like, what is gonna hit and make sure that every woman can, you know, feel it. Um, but yeah, that's the that's the reason why there's so many songwriters, I guess, on certain songs, just because of sampling. And it's not usually because it's like 12 writers in a room. Usually that doesn't happen. Sure. Mm -hmm. And also like, with Cozy, right, I did an idea to it, and then, like, the dream would, you know, <coughs> change one line, so then he gets credited, and, yep. then, you know, that might go to someone else, and then they get credited. So that's usually how things happen like that. Cozy, it's an interesting word. You don't hear it in too many pop songs, too many, any kind of songs. It instantly grabs you. What, As a songwriter, I'm curious, like, what does the word cozy do or, or bring to mind? Why is that yeah. a good word for a song? Cozy, well, for me, I love to pull stuff from my everyday life. Like, yeah. I say cozy all the time. Okay. You know, I'm cozy right now. Like, I'm yeah. very comfortable. Yeah. So I was just really thinking of a witty way to say that, like, I'm really just comfortable with who I am, you know, comfortable in my skin with all the mistakes that I've made. And I was just like, I've never heard someone say that before. So, totally. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, how about about damn time, Blake? What can you say about how the, the, the collaborative aspect of that went? I've always, my whole life, kind of just made music with my friends. I, I hate making music alone. I don't like, it's just not fun for me. And I think About Damn Time especially sounds like as much fun as we had making it. Mm. Like we spent so many months getting every part of it perfect. I think Lizzo's so much more than her music. She stands for so much more. And I think she takes a big responsibility with that. And from that, cares about her art in such an specific and incredible way that every lyric, every melody, every production choice has to be exactly what she intends it to be. And that's my dream working with an artist like that. So I think it just sounds like how we made it. I, same with Unholy, honestly. Like Unholy, we literally had a party in the studio while we were making it. And it wow. sounds Actual like Actual party? Like basically, yeah. I'll never forget when Kim <laughs> came in and did her verse on it. She did two verses that were unbelievable and all of us were like, jaw dropped, couldn't even believe that it happened. I, like, everyone's different. I I hate making music alone, because I, it's, music is all about energy and feeling to me, mm -hmm. and whatever feeling you're trying to bring across, you know, if it's the saddest song in the entire world, sometimes you just want to hear what it sounds like of a person being the saddest ever alone in their bed. Mm. But if you're having a party or, or a song like Unholy, it's like, None of us were thinking what person is doing this, what specific person is doing this. It's just like, let's all just have fun and make music and make something that people love. And yeah, I also think like as a songwriter, like I have so many friends that like, I'm like, this person is so good at this. Like, I'm gonna call this person up because I want to bring some of that into my song. And then this producer, you know, is good at this. And like, I feel like uh, you just kind of make your friends that you like making music with all of their specific skills. And then, then like, yeah, you know, a song can end up having a lot of writers, but still be, you, you know, that doesn't make it any, less amazing sure. right? and it kind of just brings more flavors in, into it and I think it um, I feel like a lot of times people like use that as like a negative thing yeah. on the internet and yeah. stuff like that and I, I don't feel like it is mm -hmm. because like you know songwriters like 
are so inspiring to each other and there's communities and friendships and I think it's kind of a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody enjoy writing by themselves? Anybody like that? I do. <laughs> yeah? I do. How I started out was in my dorm room, just like me, myself, and my computer. Um, so I think that's how I started off and then I had to learn to co-write. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that I, I reverted to doing that in the pandemic because we you know, mm. couldn't work with anybody else. Yeah. Um, but also, we learned how to co-write through Zoom, so that was cool. But I think just like my first instinct is like, okay, me, myself, and my cocoon. <laughs> and just, you know, just writing mm -hmm. on the mic. I think some songs require just a little self, um, like introspection, like, you know, there's no way that I could say what I wanna say if I have interference. Um, and I could, you know, be a hundred percent or just write like a song by myself, you know, on a guitar or yeah. maybe not piano like you, you're incredible. <laughs> but um, I love co-writing. I think it's just great to like, you know, I have my unique perspective and my life experience, but how much wider of a perspective would you have if you have three people who can bounce ideas off you and, you know, maybe they've seen things you haven't seen. So I really enjoy co-writing. Babyface, your new record is a collaboration with mm -hmm. a dozen different women. When you were writing songs for that, knowing that you're going to have different voices on each song, how does that impact the songwriting? Well, that was easier because I wrote it with right. every one of those artists. Right. And so where I've, a lot of times I would write it myself and it'd be my voice, just my voice, and it's like, this is what I think you should say. Yeah. Um, and it worked for a while, but it was so much more fun to to do it with everybody. Money came in and we we did something and I was like, that was my first time really working with her. And, and got, she got in there and said, oh my God, we work together. And I was like, oh my God, these young girls are just kicking ass and in terms of what they have to say and how they say it. So I, in, in all honesty, I was it was like I was in school mm. uh, learning um, their flow and what their voices are like today. And so that was, it was a fun process for me in that sense because my, my ears are always open to learn new things and to, to learn how to say things differently just for writing, for writing's sake. When you ask the question of, about, is it fun to write by yourself? I think you only write by yourself if, if you have to. Um, but other than that, it's far better to write with people. And sometimes you can have somebody that's writing with you that's not even really writing with you. They're just, it's just their energy. And they help you think of things that you wouldn't necessarily think of. Mm -hmm. So they might not have a particular line of something that they said. They're like, well, what do you think of this? No, I don't like that, but I'll go this way. Mm -hmm. So that kind of makes them part of the process if, you, if, mm -hmm. if you're working with them that they tell you where not to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. And um, so I think that ultimately, um, you know, co-writing is, it, it, there's something to get from it, you know. There are people that like to always write by themselves. And those people, you just, you know, go ahead and do it yourself. And, yeah. You know. And, and in terms of the, the million people on a song, there are, there's the, uh, there are the people that do the sampling. And it's, it's just kind of going out, getting a piece of the song from everybody else. And someone put something in there, someone put it. It's like creating a gumbo. And ultimately, you know, if you, this gumbo, if it has that many ingredients with that, that many people, then if it's great, then it's great. But yeah. So, um, and you don't want to just kind of just throw people out because it's, well, you didn't say enough, you didn't say that they still were part of that gumbo. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, it all becomes one, one particular thing. There was no part of there was no part of you that when you when this whole controversy happened about these Beyonce credits whatever there was no part of, you understood it you were like I understand what this is it, I mean it happens so much today because when people start songs it, it, one one song starts here but it goes through so many through the process yeah. of trying to make it better yeah and in that process so many different people touch it yeah mm -hmm. and they actually bring something to the table that matters their their names are only there because it helped move it forward mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so. No one's necessarily taking a ride. Okay. I can promise you, they, ain't nobody letting anybody take rides. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so at this particular point, it, it's it's part of the gumbo, and you just gotta kind of gotta deal with it. Um, there are so many things that so many different flavors that people add, and um, and there are those that can do it by themselves. But you know, um, 
there's nothing wrong with, you know, trying to put some some more flavors in your gumbo. Yeah, yeah. Kim, Unholy has made history in a couple of different ways this year. Uh, you know, when it topped the Hot 100, first song by an openly non-binary person and an openly trans person to get there. And same at the Grammys. Um, I, I wonder if your feeling is that music is becoming more inclusive, if it's feeling like a better, more inclusive, safer space. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, for sure. It, it felt like a, a lot of doors were uh, very closed. Uh, yeah. Others were very open. Uh, I started out as, out as a songwriter and uh, I really like just feel so, felt so welcomed, especially in the songwriter community always. Um, as an artist, it was a little harder, but I started that kind of later in my career. Mm -hmm. But I feel like with songwriting, especially kind of in LA and when you find your people, all that matters is, is your music good. You know, it's everything else goes out the window and uh, that becomes the only thing that matters. And so um, uh, it was really like amazing to just kind of see that part of my life, which has been so like, you know, when people like met me, it was like, yeah. oh, you're transgender, and it was this big thing. And I feel like in the music community, it was just like, well, your song, you sound dope, and you sound amazing, or this is cool, yeah. or um, uh, you know, and people kind of uh, just let that. Yeah, just let that go out the window. And then as an artist, it was all about kind of uh, proving that there's an audience for me. I definitely uh, started independent because it was kind of like I needed to start small and in like little clubs and stuff like that and really build a fan base to prove like, okay, there's people who, uh, you know, are, are down for this and yeah. are, uh, you know, understand it. And, and so it's, it's such a massive honor and a uh, great thing for for me, Sam has been such an incredible collaborator, someone who truly cares about writing and about melodies. And it's it's so hard sometimes to find artists who also just love to write. And uh, so, yeah, it was just all around really, really dreamy and feels really uh, incredible. And I just feel like honored to be at this table right now with all of you guys because you're all legends. And, uh, this is so cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at the um, at the American Music Awards, you took a, you were presenting and you took a second to to bring to, to create some space for people to think about what happened recently in Colorado Springs. And I wonder, you know, the, the inclusivity that we're talking about in the music industry is wonderful, but it comes at the same time that there's a lot of horrific violence and some, you know, really uh, damaging legislation that's happening. I wonder how you reconcile those two things. You, the, the, your professional world, the industry you work in, seems to be making great strides, but then the sort of like world outside that maybe less so. Is it hard to balance those two things? Um, uh, uh, yes, I mean, I, I felt really emotional uh, yesterday at the American Music Awards, just because kind of I, uh, as a fan of music, where I kind of could always be myself was gate clubs, you know? I, I would, um, uh, you know, listen to the songs I want to hear with people that love the same music as me and like no one loves pop music more than gay clubs like in the world you know and so that was my uh my safe place as a kid that i could go to to feel uh accepted and you know uh like myself and yeah. so just that is you know it, that could be my friends uh that could be me uh that could be uh, you know my entire community and uh, just as a fan of music, I, I want to protect that, and like I want, I, you know, I want to do something to just make those spaces, uh, you know, make that not happen again. But yeah. I mean, just gun control in general is is insane in the USA, and mm. uh, there's so many tragedies and so many, you know, things happening all the time that it's like, yeah, I, but no one really knows what to do, you know. So it's rough. Does unholy go off in the club? Have you gotten to experience that? Yeah. <laughs> <It's off>. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> yeah, no, no, for sure. I mean, I mean, uh, there's there's a, a disclosure remix which I really recommend, which I love. I love disclosure. <laughs> um, but but yeah, it, it goes off. Is the club is that a good way to determine what's happening with your songs? You can hear it on the radio, oh, and that's amazing. Yeah. You can hear it in whatever, commercial. What about the club? Where does that rank? Oh my God, yes. And I haven't experienced it fully yet with my song, but it's kind of like unheard of to have a ballad sure. be in the club yeah. and to hear like on Instagram, you know, people posting stuff on their stories and you just hear people screaming mm. word for word the entire song. Um, 
I just can't wait to be in the crowd. And it's probably be a little bit more difficult now as like more people are able to recognize me as time goes on. Um, but just to like experience that, just have people like vibing mm -hmm. to your stuff. Like, you know, people come out, they get dressed, they spend money to get in. And your song is a song that, you know, helps them forget about the craziness. It's, yeah. it's gotta be an incredible feeling. I'm a little jealous that you get to. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Um, Money, let's talk a minute about your career. It's been interesting, kind of a one of one. It's It's been a twisty path. You've done a lot of different things. Um, for people who don't know, you've made music under different names, different styles. N knowing where you are now, are, are you glad that it was such a twisty path? Is there something good about that? I am. I mean, it's a, it, there's always, like, polarity with everything. Um, I think that I am who I am today because of all the things that I've gone through. I've learned so much. Um, I got to see behind the veil with a lot of a-list talent um so i get to see what it looks like or mm. i got to see what it looks like mm. to have a really tight ship um and I, there's a lot of things that i took and put on my own vision board um and then also too like i realized recently that maybe that's why it took me so long is because i was trying to get other people to help me and when i just decided to help myself mm. is when it went pew um so that was a very um welcome hard lesson that I had to learn um but I don't regret anything I mean there were some very very horrible times but at the end of the day it's gonna make an awesome movie <laughs> <laughs> um I thought we could talk for a second about there's kind of different approaches to pop stardom in this moment there's you, you could think of it maybe as like the Beyonce model someone who really lets her music kind of do the talking she's not out there giving every interview she can or, you know, talking to her fans on social media. And then there's like a, maybe like a Taylor Swift model, which is someone who's in like constant communication with her fans. What feels like the natural tendency for each of you? Is it, is it to really be always engaging with fans or is it to be a little bit more like, let me just, let me just do this thing and then we'll see where the music goes? Um, if I may, I think what works for someone um, who's gonna be in the light. Yes. Is you have to do what's most authentic to you. Um, I think people accept Beyonce not talking to you because she don't do that right. in person. It's kind of like, oh, you know, <laughs> it's giving that, like, oh, I saw her hair, you know. Um, <laughs> but then you have, like, me, I'm a very personable person. I'm always taking over every room, you know, I'm like, hey, how you doing? Are you good? You want something to drink? This is not my house. I don't know where it is, but <laughs> you know what I mean? That's yeah. just me. Yeah. And so I am always in the comments. I am always talking to people. I am always, you know, making people feel at home, but that's me. And so that's why it works. Mm -hmm. um, I think once you find your voice and you're able to be yourself on social media, because you can't really switch it up. Like people are love to catch you in a lie. Mm. Um, Say more, catch you, catch you in what? In a lie, like they want us, they want to see you yes. be inauthentic. They're like, oh wait, you're you're a money long fan now, because like six months ago you tweeted that you didn't like her hair. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, yeah. So you just have to be. I think that's what the it factor is: is being unafraid to be vulnerable and authentic in front of the world. And it's really hard to do that yeah. um, unless you have done the work and you love you and you love yourself, whether you make mistakes, like you said earlier, and you are. Um, you give yourself the grace to be someone who is learning and, you know, we're human. Is that, does that get easier or harder? Babyface, you've been a public figure for decades. Does it, are you more comfortable than you've ever been in front of just cameras in the world or whatever? Are you less comfortable? How has that like changed if it has? Get used to it after a while, I guess. But I, I'm not, I've never been that the Beyonce's are the, or the Whitney's are the, the Bobby Browns, the the all the people that I've worked with, I've never been those people. I've been more behind the scene, even, even though I've been an artist. I, I was never, as you say, in the light per se. Mm. Um, and um, and there's, there's a question of the it factor. That's that's interesting. You, you, you the it factor is um, a crazy thing because sometimes it is about being honest and being who you are, but sometimes it's being the exact opposite. 
a certain artist that I've known. Hmm. Like, once you actually go behind the curtains, they're completely different than this mm -hmm. persona that they, mm. they appear to be. But they knew what they had to be in order to shine. Um, so sometimes the it factor is, is knowing what to do, knowing how to, um, knowing how to come off. And, and it's a little, it's, it's much harder to do that today because there's nowhere to hide behind. Mm. So social media has changed it all to where the it factor now means something different because they can tell whether you're real or not in yeah. that sense and whether you, whether you speak. And, and Beyonce, she's, she's a classic um, superstar. She came in the day where she can. She doesn't have to do those things. She's she's too big to have to answer anybody at this particular point. She's proven herself over and over again. And the way she carries herself is, I carry myself as Beyonce. I'm, I don't have to answer to you. Yeah. And that's a great place to be in. I don't think that everybody, any starting artist today, can make that, can make that same move. You cannot be as mysterious or mystique. Uh, it can't quite be that way because kids want to know mm -hmm. and and people want to know and and so it's it's it makes it a makes it a more difficult thing and even for myself you have had to be far more vocal uh maybe in things if, if i'm pushing like i'm doing this album with the girls i definitely were more vocal not just for myself but also for them because i wanted to celebrate them and for me to celebrate them and not say anything then i'm not celebrating them mm. so um the world is definitely different and so because of social media it certainly has changed and you do have to speak more you have to be um uh you have to be honest and and real about who you are who, who's an example if you can think of one of i mean you've worked with some of the legends in music who's somebody who turned out to be just totally different than you expected I can't say. Right. I was going to say, you're trying to get us in trouble. Fair. Well, I won't say, put it that way. Okay. Okay. Um, that's fair. <laughs> um, the Grammys have a long and interesting history with hip hop and R&B and black music. Some people say it's been handled well. Some people say it's been not handled well. Um, if you're willing to say, what? What's been going on? What's the what's the vibe? Why has it been handled well or not well? Any thoughts? I mean, I have my own opinions. Please. I think there's lots of different layers. It's, there's a book called Hitman that came out a long time ago that talks about genres and how R&B, before it was called R&B, it was called race records, uh, race music. And so I think that has been a um, very insidious factor mm. in why you know, Lizzo or Beyonce is nominated in the R&B category simply because she's black. Mm -hmm. um, you know, her last album was not R&B, in my opinion, although EDM and dance music is derivative mm -hmm. of, you know, black music and was started um, just, just like country music, you know, it has roots mm -hmm. in black culture. Um, it's not It's not an R&B album, it's a dance album. If you If you go look at the where it is in the genres on Apple Music. It's in the dance category. Mm. Um, but, you know, I think this is like semantics sometimes. Is right. Who is in charge of putting those things in those categories? You know, when Lizzo and Doja Cat are in R&B categories in The weekend, and Drake, you know, it's like, who is doing that? And why do you think that that belongs in that category? Because the, the people who are consuming it, if you go look at the comments on um, mm -hmm. Instagram and in the blogs, they're like, what? This makes no sense. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It's, it's kind of hard to debate when there's like a ghost figure that mm -hmm. is like there's no face to the. We don't know who to talk to. And then on the other side with um, some of the, you know, black categories, black music, hip hop, R&B, traditional R&B, contemporary there's not a lot of representation actually voting. Um, and I think it's it's been a problem. Like, it's the Grammys are voted by your peers. Um, you kind of have to be seen and you have to be present to, like, in front of mind. Um, you know, kind of out of sight, out of mind. We don't see you. Yeah. And so when it's time to vote, you're not in the front of our mind. You have to be active. You have to be, like, if you want to win, you have to show or if you want to be included you have to like 
raise your hand and be like, I'm here. Um, and I think sometimes people feel like that's like auditioning or I feel like I got to, you know, dance on the table mm. to get notoriety or to get attention. But it's a combination of we just don't know to vote for you because we don't see you, you know. Yeah. In my opinion, that's what it's been. I vote every year. Um, there's a lot of people who are submitting mm -hmm. music and it's a tedious process. And if I don't immediately recognize your name or your song, I'm probably not going to click your name. And that's just the reality of it. Sure. Um, yeah. And a lot of times I'm voting for the songs that I recognize mm -hmm. yeah. and the things that I love out of what I recognize. So if I don't recognize you, not gonna that's, that's the reason, to yeah. be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are a lot of people who are incredibly talented who I'm sure deserve to win and be acknowledged, but I don't see you. Is not so much in terms of the Grammys, but just generally speaking, uh, Nisha and Blake, I'm interested to know as songwriters, does putting yourself out there feel like a natural thing for you to do? Or are you like, yo, I got into songwriting because I didn't want to be the, 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 in front? You know what I mean? Um, no, I think it's, I honestly think it's natural just because of social media. Right, especially because that's how I even got into songwriting was networking via mm. social media and showcasing what I was doing mm -hmm. on like Instagram back then and Twitter. Um, and now with TikTok, it makes it even m more of a bigger platform to reach out to, you know, showcase your work to a bigger audience. So now, like walking out, walking down the street, like I remember actually just yesterday, like somebody was like, "Oh, you're the girl from TikTok," and I'm mm. like. TikTok, really? Yeah. Hmm. So, so um, how you view yourself necessarily? Right. I'm like, yeah. okay, yeah, you know, I've been Grammy nominated, but you know, I'm, I'm the girl from TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know, it just goes to show that, like, you know, even though we're behind the scenes, um, at least for me, it is natural to put yourself out there and not just, you know, be hidden. Especially because I want to kind of rework that whole notion of songwriting being um, a mystery or something that is taboo. Yeah. It's like, no, songwriters, producers, artists, we're all collaborators. And I feel like the world should know that as well. So for me, it's natural. What about you, Blake? You, you've, you, you know, I don't know what the right word would be. Uh, uh, Benny Blanco was a guy who you worked with when you were first starting out in your career. That's a very visible figure. He's always out, he's in TV shows, whatever. What's your view at, for the job that you do, the way that you consider yourself to be in pop music? Do you think of yourself as someone who's kind of out there or less so? Absolutely not. I'm, I'm actually <laughs> okay. the opposite. Yeah. But I'm really just the biggest fan of music in so many senses of the word. And my instinct is never to be in the spotlight or, or trying to do anything like that. But I will say that doing things like this are very important to me because, you know, obviously getting to sit at a table with you guys with baby faces, man, is one of the biggest idols I've ever had in my life. And like getting to listen to your interviews when I was growing up and starting as a producer was so inspiring and so meaningful for me. So I feel like when it's the right thing like this and, and to be with creators that I respect and respect me, it's important for me to, to sometimes speak about my process yeah. a little bit because if I can inspire another producer like this man inspired me or so many of the other producers that I've listened to, that's like would be my purpose in life, you know? Right. right. But, but no, I work with pretty much only artists that are so themselves and such figures and such bigger than their music and and there's nothing I can bring to the table without them you know what I mean it's all just anything I can do to be a part of their story and their journey and their career and and be a part of new moments like for example Sam I was such a big fan of them since I was 10 years old I was covering their songs on piano mm. and to be a part of a moment like Unholy with Kim that's so different from what they normally do is the most special thing. And, and that could never come from me. I couldn't, yeah. I could never sit and say, hey, let's do the something that sounds like this. You know what I mean? That's all mm -hmm. Sam and Kim. Same with, with Lizzo. Lizzo is someone who I was such a massive fan of before I even ever worked with her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, making a song, it's not like I can go into a room and say, you know what? We're going to make the song that's going to make you feel great about getting out of the mm -hmm. pandemic. You know what I mean? That's, yeah. 
all Lizzo, and, and I feel so lucky to be in the room and help make that a reality. So I don't, I don't feel like I have anything personally that I would want to blast out to the world that's a Blake Slapkin thing. You yeah. know, I, I just feel like, again, as the biggest fan of all these artists, getting to be in a room with them and be in any part of what they do is, I don't even understand how it's a job. What, what Sam Smith songs did you learn to play when you were young? Uh, I did, I'm not the only one. Sure. I did Stay With Me. Of course. I did, I like all those. Like, Good covers or? Terrible. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> but I was learning. Of course. Um, what's the worst part of your job, don't don't say this. Don't say this right now. Not sleeping. <laughs> Not sleeping. Ooh. I love to sleep. Mm -hmm. You don't get much of it. No. no. What's what, what about you guys? What what's something that you accept as part of the gig, but not your favorite thing? Time management. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I love what I do, um, and I think growing up, you you idolize the people you work with, and you're just like you never want to tell anybody no, and you kind of forget that you're a human at the end of the day. Mm. Um, you spend time away from your family, um, and you sometimes forget about yourself um, because you put your work first, or you know you just want to seize it, every opportunity. Um, so I think that's the that's the hardest part of the job is just like remembering self care and you know put yourself first sometimes. What about you, Kim? Vocal rest. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh God, that's oh so hard God. to shut up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Vocal rest is the worst. I, I mean, I, I kind of type things into like this little app that speaks it for me, but I just like I hate not being able to use my voice. But it's yeah. it's usually for a good thing. You usually want to have like a show, uh, something like that. I you know, but how yeah. long are we talking? Two, four hours to ten no, hours? Like a day, a whole day. Days, yeah, mm. D depending. Like yeah. I've I've had like nodules before and things like that, and I used to write way higher songs than you can technically like perform uh in a row all the time so i've, I've kind of had to like learn that and just like know how to navigate you know the the vocal cords and yeah uh because yeah it's a tricky thing and doing it over and over and over kind of uh yeah it's it's a lot to uh think about and i, mm. I miss that about just I, I love you know that about being in the studio like kind of I, like i can drink i can <laughs> smoke if i want to yeah. and yeah. uh you know i can just uh take my time and get it perfect uh but yeah vocal rest is a little sucky but worth it because i also yeah. want to be at 100 percent when i perform so sure so sure. i shut up <laughs> <laughs> i need that app <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Have, have the other singers in the room had ever scary experiences where you thought you had lost it or damaged or whatever? Mm, absolutely. Yeah? Yeah, I completely lost my voice in 2018. It was gone. I couldn't sing at all. Wow. Um, I recently actually just got my voice back. Um, turns out I had blocked sinuses, so that's why. And I couldn't hear. It was, it was really bad. Um, also struggled with lupus, and so my um, internal medicine doctors just chucked it up to lupus. Mm. So they weren't actually like trying to fix it. Um, but that's when, you know, you just have to stick to your instincts. And I was like, nah, something is wrong. <laughs> um, and I went and got it fixed, but it's a scary feeling. I had to learn to sing around it. Um, mm. That's where this new style of singing came from. It's very like soft, sexy thing that people interpreted as sexy, but Really, it was just because I couldn't hit <laughs> any other notes. Yes. Exactly. Um, nice. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Small blessings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just sounds great that way. Um, I think that um, for me, that that's it's funny that you mentioned that because that's when when I go out and do shows, that's the th one thing I worry about is having a voice. Um, and when you end up doing, if you go out for a little while and stay out there, then there's no way. It's very hard to keep that voice going, and and so. As great as everything else is, once you get up there on that stage, you got to sit there and worry about mm. whether are you going to sound your best, and then you got to worry out worry about how to figure out how to get through certain areas without using the soft voice, and 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 so that you can still come off come off good. I remember <clears throat> I, w I was talking to this guy from the OJ's this group, old group called the OJ's, and a guy named Eddie um, Eddie Levert. He's like the main guy, and I asked him said, what do you do when you go out every night? Because he has his hard voice and he's got to go hard every night. I said, I know they're expecting you to, like, kill it every night. And there's no way 
with that voice, you're going to be able to kill it every night. What do you do when that comes? Yeah. And he said his, I forget ex the exact words, but he said, it is not, it is not what you, uh, it's not what comes out of you. It is the intention mm -hmm. of, of what you are giving them. He said, they know that, they know I sung a song. And they know that I've sung it before. But if I can't give everything, but they know I'm giving 110%, even when I don't have it, that's when they love you the most. Mm. You know, it's when you give up and you're not giving 100% is when they can figure out, oh, he's faking it. Mm. Mm -hmm. but even if you can't hit the notes, it's not that you don't hit the notes, it's whether, whether you tried. Mm. And he said, you keep that in mind, then they'll be with you all the time. So don't, don't, don't let that get in your head. Go 110% all the time. Even if you find other ways to get around it, as long as they know that you're giving everything and not just kind of like, you know, walking away from it. That's for you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's amazing. Thanks. <laughs> I wonder if you could think of a, of a song that you've been working on and you're just, you're going at it, you're just trying to figure this song out and it's just not working and then something happens. The magical key unlocks the song and you got it. And you can look back and be like, oh, of course, but at the time you didn't know it. Does, can, does, does an instance like that spring to mind where it, something had to arrive for you to unlock the song? I don't know. I'm <laughs> always looking for that <gasps> moment yeah. mm -hmm. of like when something happened, I'm like, ooh, you know, I like that. What, what did you say? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. um, and I can never like recreate the moment because it's always coming from another place. Um, it's like, I'm just like the channel, you know, or I'm like the TV that plays the show. Um, and I'm just kind of the interpreter, like using what vocabulary and, um, skill set and notes that I have in my Rolodex to interpret what I'm receiving. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I don't know, like you'll never hear me do like a minor, it's not in my catalog mm. um even when i do something that's sad it still sounds happy <laughs> you know it's like light and uh i don't know there's never like a i got the secret formula yeah, it, yeah. i think the secret mm. is just being open yeah and being um ready for the song when it comes down because a lot of times the song writes itself and you just like stay childlike um, Lionel Richie said that too in his acceptance speech about inspiring and even on the video that they played, you just have faith and be ready and that's when the magic stuff happens. And um, I don't know if you've ever written something completely magical, you sort of like tune out and you're just in a zone. Mm -hmm. And then when it happens, you you know, sometimes I even catch myself laughing like, oh, did you hear that? <laughs> right? yeah, 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 yeah. You know? And then I go back and I'm listening to him. I was like, oh, that was a triple entendre. Mm -hmm. I didn't even try to do that. You know, you it can't is, take credit for it. It's part of that knowing. Yes, I understand the concept of like waiting for the magic, mm -hmm. but you also have to know when it arrives, right? Like, have you gotten better at sort of being able to judge mm -hmm. when something comes? Oh, yes, this is quite good. Do you know what I mean? I think I judge it off like my natural reaction to it. Like if I laugh, if it makes me happy, if it makes me feel free, you know, I follow that. Yeah. Um, if it ever feels too much like work, like I'm trying to shove mm. like a square peg in a round hole, I just be like, mm, next. Mm. It should never feel forced, yeah. um, in my opinion. It does not, like if I'm just slaving over this one word, I was like, next, I'll come back to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, the idea is sort of just like bleh. That's interesting. I mean, you know, I, for, as a non-songwriter, I have it just you you would automatically assume that like, oh, well, you just sit there and you sweat it out and then you make it happen and eventually it gets there. You hammer it into shape. Oh, surely that has to happen. That sometimes. sounds horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, I've yeah. I've done that. I used to do that. I'm, I feel like I'm very German that way. It's like it needs to hurt, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like breaking my brain over stuff for like years. I, I definitely was there. And I think once I stopped 
doing that and once I stopped kind of that mentality of yeah. like uh, you know I just like I believe in this so much but it just isn't happening isn't falling into place like once I kind of stopped forcing and just kept going uh, you know now every time I get stuck on something I change the song and then come back to yeah. it see if it was any good um, uh, I, I definitely think you know it also taught me things to be like super crazy analytical and uh, super you know spend months on like how do I make this the most amazing Amazing piece ever, uh, um, uh, but but yeah, um, I think uh, a lot of the great stuff uh, is just when you're just having fun and it just happens and it just feels right. Uh, I mean, people songwriters always say, "Oh yeah, I wrote that incredible like number one hit." That was, that was like a twenty minute. Yeah, those are the best ones. There are those. Mm -hmm. Is that true? I mean, there are some that, that just come immediately, but then there are those that take a long time to get there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have something that's really special and you can't figure it out. And it takes a long time to actually get there. And, and the biggest thing you can have is patience. Mm. Is just to not force it and just wait for it to True. come. Mm -hmm. That's what it was for us on About Damn Time. Yeah. We, uh, we had been working on this little nugget of inspiration that we had. That was one of those moments where it was like, okay, this is special. Which was like a lyric or a chord or what? It was, uh, it was a chorus. Yeah. And we had been working in the biggest, most expensive studio with <laughs> every keyboard, every guitar, and there was one day, I think, where we couldn't get the studio. And we ended up going to this little room that is Lizzo's favorite place to record, where she's the most comfortable. We hadn't worked there on the whole song. And the track was super crowded. We were kind of like lost on it. And we took out, in the second verse, we took out all the music, so it was just the bass and drums. And I watched Lizzo's eyes light mm -hmm. up and go in the booth and freestyle the second verse, the in a minute, I'm gonna need, which is kind of the hook of the song mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And it was just like, to me, it's the perfect moment to, to represent the fact that it doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter who you're with, it, all that matters is that you're comfortable and that the second that that moment of inspiration that you have no idea where it came from, you couldn't replicate it in a million years if you try, the second that comes and that comes out of you, it can be, I mean, it changed the entire song. It changed mm -hmm. everything. Sure. We all knew she kind of did, and everyone was kind of like, nobody move. Like, nobody do anything. <laughs> like, let's just stay here and let this come out. And after it came out, I mean, I wanted to, like, throw up and shit and cry at the same time. <laughs> like, yeah. I can't even believe this is, like, this happened. Yeah, no, it's energy. It's like, I tell people all the time, like, don't you dare sing this on this microphone if you are not feeling the way that you want other people to feel when they hear it because like that waveform is a visual representation of what happens every day right now when mm. I'm talking to you, the vibrations going in your ears. So that's why when someone is like, I hate you, it hurts. Or when someone says, oh, I love you so much, baby, you feel it and it makes you melt. It's like those vibrations are moving the molecules in your body. And so you have to feel happy when you're in the studio because that energy is transferable. People are listening to that and they feel what you felt in that moment. You're sitting in a room with very smart writers around you. Yeah. Kids that, you know, that have figured it out, how their their mode of doing it. And where I've been in the room with a lot of writers that aren't that smart. And they just kind of just kind of go for it and throw out any kind of words and say that's good and then they're done. And they think they're done. And this is not that room that you that you see. These are guys that are that really put thought and effort into every word and every feeling that comes on there because they're pushing themselves and, and the experience. And that is, um, that is the makeup of what Grammy writers should be. They should be those that, you know, go a little bit, go a step further and not just accidentally in, end up there, but end up there because they put the work in and they put their heart in and they put their soul in it. And, and I think that's what's, what's required. And so, it's not always it's not always great when you when you see who ultimately ends up being on the list mm -hmm. at the Grammys because there's so many people that get overlooked and and you're right the list is so long that by the time you, people don't think to even look at every name they get tired halfway through and they, they I'm just going to go with what I go with yeah. Yeah. so so many people lose because of that or they don't or they don't get remembered because of that but what I can say that I'm happy to be at this table why I'm happy to be at this table because like each one of these writers are those kind of writers that I'm happy to sit here with, you know, and be a part of because I think they're those kind of writers that give their heart, give their soul, and think about it all the way through. So 
Just, just wanted to say that to you guys. I'd say on that too. Well, <laughs> right. Like, First thank, of all, thank you. Yeah, I'm thank you. Shitting, crying, and throwing up at the same time. <laughs> Massive. I'd say on that. That's a perfect thing. Going back to the many writers on a song and and people having anything to say about how many writers are a part of this. It's like it's if you see the same name coming up mm-hmm. over and over again. It's not easy to get hit songs. It's not easy to make a lot of songs that people like. If you keep seeing the same name over and over, it's not an accident. Like yeah. it doesn't matter if there's 30 writers on every single song and there's one that just keeps getting it. Yeah. There's something that they are bringing to the table, obviously. It's like this is not it's not it doesn't just keep happening. The numbers end. don't you lie. Know what I mean, like this man has had 50 Grammys. <laughs> it's like it's obvious, you know yes. what I mean? Like yeah, so I, I would say it, it, modern music, sure, there's a lot of writers sometimes, and sure, there's not, and I think there's just nothing different. It, music is music. Yeah. Great music is great music. Who cares? Like, if you love a great song, you love a great song. Why does it matter how it got made? Mm-hmm. Uh, mentors and protégés. Who, who, who are some mentors that, that spring to mind for you guys? Who's someone who truly made a difference in your career? Um, Jay Grand from RCA, he was one of the first people that really took me in under his wing um, when I was in college and showed me how to write in the studio. Mm -hmm. Like, that was my first session ever. And I just remember he was just like, oh, just say whatever comes to mind. Just try stuff. And, you know, to be that young and to not even know me and to take a chance and just, like, put me in rooms after that. He, he told me, after he was like, you know you have a gift. You're going to be a big writer one day. And I'm like, mm, okay, yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, and just seeing, like, his dedication to just take a chance on me and mm. just put me in rooms, I was like, okay, he's a genuine person. And, you know, he wasn't part of our management. He just wanted great records. He just wanted to work. Yeah. Um, so that was one of my mentors, especially, like, I remember when... You know, I started getting pub offers. I'm like, well, wait, how does this work? And he would, you know, just put me on game. And he was one of the first people who really, you know, mentored me. Anybody else mentor spring to mind? Or maybe just best advice you ever got? Someone who just said something to you yeah. and stuck with you. I was going to say, I've never really had, like, any mentor that... I don't, I don't know if I've had a mentor by definition. Mm-hmm. I've sort of had people who have had impactful moments on my life. Um... John Legend, Mariah Carey, Mary J. What did Mary um, J tell you? Like, what, what did she show just, you or tell you? I mean, she, there's been so many moments with her, like, mm-hmm. just in the studio where she's like, man, you just do this thing, um, and you just need to keep doing it. You know, like, I, I can't do what you do, but I'm me and you're... Just, like, by, yeah. leading by example yeah. of, like, wow, you know, she's encouraging me to be myself. Um while still being this queen, you know what I mean? And just seeing that example up close. Same thing with Mariah, it's just like, I think great people um, who see a potential great spark in you, they're gonna like pull that out of you and encourage you to be yourself and to be able to be great in the room with someone else that's incredibly great is a hard thing to do, right? To like shine in, have this bright light beside you and just, you know, Pharrell is another person. He gave me this example about, um, I remember I was in the studio with him and Dua and I just remember feeling like this is right before I quit writing for other people and I was just like, man, I don't really want to be here but I feel like, like you said earlier, I don't want to say no. It's Dua Lipa and Pharrell and, uh, you know, I showed up (laughs) and uh, I remember saying to him, I don't really want to be here. He was like, well, then why are you here? You know, Mm. your job is to shine. And if you shine this big, then you show people who shine this big that it's possible to shine this big. If you shine this big, you show people that shine this big that it's possible to shine this big. And that's it. It's you're enough. You know, I think you're an incredible artist. I don't look at you as just a songwriter, but maybe you don't know that. Maybe you don't see yourself that way. And it just hit me Mm. like, oh, crap, I'm looking... Uh, I'm looking up at you, down at myself. Meanwhile, you're looking across. Mm. And I'm like, oh, my God. 
I just blew it. I'm sure he was disappointed, like, wow, I thought you were way mm. more, <laughs> more elevated than this. But that was the day that I was like, okay, I like let go of my whole team. I went home. Um, it was August 2019. And I was like, all right, what am I going to do? Who do I want to be? How do I want to present myself to the world? And then Money Long was born. So I think it's been like so many different nuggets of people encouraging me, just whispering in my ear, be yourself. Mm. Who do you <laughs> want to be? You're dope. And me just being like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't see what you see. And it took me, took for me to like have someone be that mm. tough um, mirror. You know, we took pictures in the mirror. Like, I'm obsessed with mirrors. It took for somebody to be that mirror, to, for me to really see myself and be like, oh, wow, you are not um, stepping into your light the way that you should be. So I've had lots of different moments, not really one person. Yeah, I've, I've had mentors that I just am so grateful for. It's just when people, I think, just uh, see talent in you and uh, give you advice and uh, show you uh, their, their their tricks and their processes and uh, it definitely like for me was so because I, I never knew anyone growing up in the music industry like I'm from a different country mm -hmm. um, I grew up in Germany and it's very um, uh, it's even culturally different but I feel like music has taught me everything uh, like uh, about all of those things and it's at the end of the day just about uh, emotion and about you know staying positive and hanging in there and just like I feel like I really uh I, I really wouldn't be where I am without like incredible people who um kind of believed in me against kind of odds um uh, that were there and I, I'll forever be special, like super, super grateful um for those people and I feel like every songwriter uh I've worked with um in this like kind of, uh, yeah, every song that I work with teaches me something. And I think that's really incredible. I'm so inspired by songwriters in general. I think they're the best people and I love being a songwriter. <laughs> yes, I, sorry, <laughs> I feel like I'm talking way too much. <laughs> okay. Present company excluded. What are you guys excited about right now? Who have you heard that turns you on that you think peop more people need to hear so-and-so? Ice Spice. Yep. Yeah. I, <laughs> I love Ice Spice. Yeah. Say a few words. What moves you? You thought I was feeling you? <laughs> <laughs> but no, me and my sister were actually just having a conversation about her. And, you know, there, everyone has mixed reviews about her. But one thing that I really appreciate is, like, how authentic she is in her music and how relatable she is. Um, you know, the, the bars that she sang... It's just like how my homegirls would talk back home. And I'm like, I, I, it's like a conversation on a drill beat, which there's not a lot of female rappers on New York drill beats or UK drill beats. So I thought it was genius, especially just like something so simple yeah. as you thought I was feeling you. Like, <laughs> it's a rhetorical question. And I don't know, a, a, lot, a lot of her songs, I'm just like, wow, like people are asleep on this. Um, but yeah, just a few songs of, of hers like just really excited me. Um, and as a woman, just makes me feel empowered. Mm -hmm. So she's the one person that I'm excited about for sure. Who else? Throw out some more names. I love Shy Girl. Obsessed. Yeah? UK artist. Check out BB, one of my favorite songs. Uh, yeah. She's just uh, really speaking to me. I love her like sonic world. It's like a lot of like techno and uh, that kind of kind of mixed in with just her flows and stuff. I recommend check out Jack Girl. I love Pink Panthers. Mm -hmm. Yes. I love. There's a girl named Hemlock Springs. Mm -hmm. Put out a song called Boy F Girl. F I've, I'm blanking, but mm -hmm. it's like my favorite song right now. It's kind of all I listen to. She yeah. produced it all by herself. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. That's cool. Any names y'all want to throw out? Um, I'm obsessed with Jacob Collier right mm. now. Just like his his videos go viral on TikTok all the time of him directing his audience. Um, and he's like a mad scientist. I really want to work with him. Glorilla is my guilty pleasure. I don't. <laughs> yeah. She just kind of like burst onto the scene a mm -hmm. few months ago, mm -hmm. and is not like I just love that she's like the people's champ. Everybody's rooting for her, and she really did have like 
the one of the best songs this summer. Um, brings out my inner. <laughs> thug, <I'm> yeah, <laughs> the people's champ. I like. No, that. she really is, man. Yeah. She's mm-hmm. so dope. Yeah, I think for, for me, I, definitely all the girls that I work with on Girls Night Out, because I, I picked them because I was inspired by all. Yeah. Of them. Each one of them, but so I won't do that. Like I'm trying to push my thing. It's a, mm. it's a regular <laughs> girls' night. <laughs> so now um, streaming. Yeah, now streaming it. But um, for me, um, I really like the writing of Steve Lacey, mm. Mm. Um, and I think that um, it's it's unique and it's and it's, it's it feels very very honest and and it's also um, intricate and uh, it's it's musical. Yeah, which. Um, it's so nice to hear that coming from a younger artist today, you know, for, for a new artist to, to be that musical and, and taking chances. And the coolest part about it is that, you know, it's working. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think that's, that's inspiring because when it, work, when, it, when it works for him, that means it can work for other artists mm-hmm. that can, can go other places and do other things. So music can keep on growing. And, um, and the, the cool part about it is it, it, it's a mixed... It's a mixture of genres all together. It's R and B. It's it's pop. It's every it's it's yeah. everything together, and um, and I think that that's the that's the that's the best thing about it. You know, um, is that that it's got all those genres mixed together. A lot there of was, music in his a music. Lot of, a lot of music in his music. Yeah. There was a time when R and B was pop. Mm-hmm. There was a time when R and B was like, you know, there was there wasn't really a separation. They weren't really, you know. Bobby Brown was at the top of charts. Whip Appeal was a top ten pop record. Sure. Um, and so that has since has been changing, and I'd like to see that change again to to go back to that because there's great music that's there, but there's been this separation that has happened. And one thing I'll say to it, which you kind of touched on, the money, was that years ago, when Michael Jackson did um, the uh, not Thriller, but Off the Wall. Mm-hmm. Uh, the RIAA, they, they labeled that as a R&B album. It was R&B. But when Michael did Thriller, which was still the same people, same, same makeup, then suddenly he was labeled pop. Mm-hmm. Um, and they labeled it pop, not because the music was different, but because so many more people cared about it. Mm-hmm. So many people heard it and liked it. So... It was no longer black because there was more people that liked it. So it wasn't really about really where the music was coming from. It was about how many people care for it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What makes it pop? What? But and I remember um, Dick Griffey, who was head of Solar Records, he was arguing that it's still R and B. You know, and so well, how can you label it, you know, differently, uh, in, any different? Because it is still basically R and B. And I think that's kind of where the mix-up goes. If if you're uh, if you're a, either a particular skin color or, if you, or you don't sell as many records, then suddenly it's not, mm-hmm. you know, it's not that. So there's where the, it, it, it gets kind of confusing there yeah. in terms of what, what that means. Yeah, um, but what I think also what I love about just social media, TikTok, what the internet does is yes. you have artists like um, Dochi, oh. Jalil, yeah, I don't know oh. if you guys know about him. He's so incredible to me. Um, you just, they don't okay. go. <laughs> they don't fit. Like, yeah. you know, like Jaleel is like this G.I. Joe who does backflips onto the stage, who <laughs> like stage dives. I, mean, I saw this clip where he, somebody threw a can of Sprite at him and he caught it <laughs> and like chugged it, you know, <laughs> crushed it on his head. And he's like, Jaleel, yeah. <laughs> you know, he looks like this army soldier, but he's singing these like happy pop trap songs it doesn't yeah. go um and then dochi who's like fashion yes. you know she's very um fearless with her presentation and she's rapping and she's singing and she's just not what you expect like her sound doesn't look like her um and i think that's super dope like i think yes. by the time people same thing that worked for me by the time people saw what i looked like it was too late <laughs> the yeah. song was already yeah. popular. Yes. Um, and so it became pop. Whereas, like, I think if I would have put that song out five, ten years ago um, as a 33-year-old independent black, you know, self-funded um, 
R&B song, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have gone anywhere because there would have been so many gatekeepers mm -hmm. and people being like, the world doesn't want this. Right. Um, especially because there was nothing out that sounded like that at the time coming out of the pandemic. Um, people were lonely and they really wanted to feel love and that my song gave them that, gave them that opportunity. And so I think it's incredible. Um, I think we are going to be able to get back to a time when R&B music is pop because it's popular yes. because people have access to it and there aren't, you know, people saying only these ABC artists can sing songs that sound like that and it'll be, um, you know, it'll bring in revenue. It's not valuable when you do it, but it's valuable when they do it. Yeah. Right. Well said. Guys, thank you so much for your time and for the thoughts and the conversation. It's been great. Really appreciate having all of you. And thanks for watching.